Hey everyone, we're uh, getting fired up here to start talking dogs and dog training and we're going to give people a few minutes here to get in and, and get settled in and then we'll we'll start going. So looking forward to it. Thanks to everyone for showing up. We're going to have a good time tonight. Oh, so what uh, what hunting trips you got coming up this fall? What do you got going on? I don't know where yet, but I'll go somewhere. I will be somewhere by September 1. <laughs> late, late August. I'm kind of remaining undecided for right now. I'm yeah. going to wait and see how some things play out and see what the weather's doing. I hear you. But uh, that's a window. I always look forward to that. <laughs> you can get some really good work done out there. Yeah, I mean, flipping just between Montana and North Dakota, or you got something else in mind? Well, the problem is, I got some places I wouldn't mind going South Dakota and Nebraska. The problem that earlier is it's usually even, even hotter. Even yeah. hotter. Could be, even could hotter, be right. even hotter. And my only concern with that Northeast Montana, Northwest North Dakota is that April storm and how bad. Or it, yeah. it may not be any big deal. Right. You know? Right. I don't know yet. The bit as you're going west anyway, you'll just decide if it's a beer this way or a, <laughs> going a beer that way. way. Probably North Dakota. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. All depends. Well, we'll see what happens at the rain, too. Mm -hmm. That could change a lot of things. Tyler well, just did a post about this tonight, just coming on, and he's under his, his awning and it's down powered right after all that snow melted. So we're not going to have a problem with water this year. <laughs> Hopefully, we just don't get another year like last year where. The spigot once it shut off, yeah, it rusted, it. it rusted shut. Well, that's what saved that area last year. Is there were some rains that kind of came through north in there mm -hmm. that everywhere else. I had some friends going to like central Montana by Glasgow, and they're like, Oh, it was there's, there's no grass, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's the moon, moon. Yeah. Yeah, 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 no grass. And then, and then you go further west, and some of those fires, and it's just like, Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, scorched earth for. March, you can see. So that's got to take a while for Burgess to come back to the area. I mean, from from enough enough sections with no bugs, no grass, no nothing, no cover. Yeah. If they sure. didn't move up, like Sharpies will move, but I don't think like runs will, will they? And it takes a little bit. Yeah. Skipping. Yeah. 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 They'll move in, but they're not going to outfly a fire. No, <laughs> but for sharp tails, fire is the. Yeah, the best thing in the world for the next season. <clears throat> Maybe a year or two later. Yeah. All kinds of orbs in there. Mm -hmm. Just you know, a lot of the native tribes call them firebirds. Because yeah. where there had been big fires, yeah. you know, they know Fire they noticed an overabundance of them right. after that. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. We had one lease burn up everything but the guy's house, about twelve thousand acres. Wow. And <coughs> two years after that, they outfit our workplace and quit. He was it's just like a shooting preserve for, yeah. wild, for wild birds. Yeah. It's just, I mean, that, it's just loads of them. Loads yeah. of them. And then, of course, it kind of stigmatized and went back to normal as yeah. the years went on. Yeah. All right. Well, we're almost, we're going to get rolling here in a second. Actually, let's just do it right now. Let's get it rolling. So, okay. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm Ben Bredigan from Honex Hunt and I've got Mr. Justin McGrail and Ron Bain with me and we're going to be talking about uh, common mistakes you make when training your dog. So uh, first off, uh, your cameras and microphones are muted so we can't see you or hear you right now. If you want to participate, um, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. You can ask questions. Feel free to do so. Uh, we've got Nick Larson from the Birdshot Podcast. He's on with us. He's going to be helping us answer questions. So if you want something uh, for Ron or Justin to address, we won't be able to get to everything. But if you want to ask him, throw him in that Q&A. Obviously, you guys are using the chat. We appreciate you letting us know. I see a lot of different states popping up all over the country. So um, this is also going to be recorded right now. It's being recorded and it'll be going up on YouTube. So um, if you want to rewatch it or send it to your friends, right. it'll be up on the Onyx Hunt YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, so at the end of the webinar, we're going to be giving away a free uh, complete series membership to Upland 
Institute, mm -hmm. as well as a bunch of Onyx hats and shirts. Uh, we'll be posting that link in the chat for you guys to enter that to win, and we'll be giving away at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you're not familiar, so we've partnered with Ron and Justin Upland Institute uh, for elite members. And what we've done is there's a curated set of videos uh, picked from the course to kind of help you guys get into it. And uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to watch it. It's fantastic. So as an elite member, you also get 15% off of uh, the, full the, the full course. Fantastic learning opportunity. So I suggest uh, we'll post a link in the chat. Go ch click it, check it out. Um, another added benefit for you elite members. So um, I guess without further ado, uh, Justin and Ron. Justin, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Tell us a little uh, bit who you are. Yeah. My name's Justin McGrail. Um, this is my 31st year training upland bird dogs full time. I got my start while I was still in high school, uh, apprenticing with a gun dog pro and got the bug and was never able to kick it. So <laughs> uh, just so folks know, all of my experience and my work is in the upland dogs. So I don't do any waterfowl training professionally. I'm not a duck hunter. Upland hunting is all I do. Yeah. Um, so most of the stuff you're going to hear tonight is pointing, dog up to when we're pointing dogs and, and um, there is some crossover and training, um, just good do's and don'ts. Sure. Although many things we'll discuss tonight right. are definitely going to be pointing dog specific. Yeah, right. right. Awesome. But a lot of puppy mistakes could go across. Sure. Yeah. Flusher sure. Types, yeah. Sure. There's a lot of good things to pay attention yeah. to regardless. Yeah. And then over here on the far side, we've got Mr. Ronnie Bain. Hello. Uh, yeah. I, if you don't know me, uh, listen to my podcast. It, uh, no. Um, I, I've, uh, I don't know. I don't have a, I don't have a dog training history. In fact, I have a history of not training my dogs. And after reconnecting with Justin and I actually met in one form or another 20 some years ago when you were at Pine Hill Kennel mm -hmm. and then we got reconnected about 10 years ago and, uh, kind of got me on the bug to get back into, you know, you get a little, you get a little complacent, you know, I mean, I used to do a lot of the things that we showed and you showed in the Upland Institute, like the, the steak and the touch and those. And I just ignored that for about a decade. <laughs> and I've paid the price it showed in your job. <laughs> right. Exactly. And those little bitty things, like I'm taking Tagus through the weight of the kennel, the weight that he threw it. I'm like, holy cow, this dog, this dog is really well. And if I let him be like the rest of anyway. It's just been fun to reconnect with Justin, and then uh, I've had him on the podcast many times, and we just always have a real lot of good engagement with question and answers, and it turned into this. I mean, I do love my job. I love my work. I love spending time with the dogs outside, but I think where I get the most true satisfaction is when I help somebody that's brand new to the sport. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought if I can help them and their dog find their way to what we all know is great fun, yeah. right? Then I've done something. Yeah. You know, that, that's my little tiny contribution yeah. to the world, right? So I really love helping people avoid problems and make their dogs better. Yeah. All right. And with that, I mean, you've got kind of like a hit list of. Yeah, I just yeah. not the it's the things not to do or try to avoid, right? I thought we'd start with some of the most common things I see that are best avoided when you're raising a dog for that first year. Yeah. Because that initial upbringing is what's setting the stage for the more advanced training that's mm -hmm. to come. And it really impacts everything you do with your dog. And right. it, it really starts from the time they're just little bugs. Um, and so I guess we'll dive right into, uh, I just made a little checklist here of the ones I see the most of, um, starting with the youngest puppies. So you're talking eight weeks old, you're just yeah, them home in to... this eight, eight to 16, 16 weeks old. So, okay. so in there, um, one is going too light on the socialization. Now, everybody preaches socialization, socialization. Well, some people I don't think really understand what is that? Yeah, what does it mean? What does that mean? Yeah. 
Um, you know, I let my kid play with my dog. I heard that's good socialization. Right. Yes, it is. Yeah. But that is not the only thing. So mm -hmm. to really grasp what the importance of socialization is, we want to acclimate our new dog, this little puppy, to everything that's going to be part of its life. So that involves not only new not people, just people, but places. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be introduced to a crate and do crate training. Car rides are a big one. Yeah. Um, every day is bring your puppy to work day for me. For you, yeah. But other people need to make <laughs> a point of, okay, I got to continually keep taking this dog places right. so that it's not a scary event. Yeah. Um, for our hunting dogs, obviously part of socialization is getting out there in the outdoor environment. I'm a nut about puppy nature walks, right? Yep. And the first month that nature walk is in your yard, really. Yeah. You know, eight to yeah. 12 weeks. Once they get a little bigger, a little stronger, I want to start to explore a new places. If I see a dog that gets to six, seven months old and it knows it's home, it's home people and it's yard and yeah. the car ride to the veterinarian, a percentage of them, when you put them in a new place and around new people, it throws them off track and it creates a nervousness and a little bit of uncertainty and a lack of confidence in a dog. Yeah. And we've been getting some, a number of questions about separation anxiety or mm -hmm. yeah. those, those undesirable behaviors. Mm -hmm. And most often you'll see that trait manifest itself in a dog who had a little bit of a genetic bent to become that way. Mm -hmm. And it was compounded through that lack of socialization. Right. It often takes both. Mm -hmm. And how that affects a dog's training yep. is when a dog is in that frame of mind of uncertainty, lacks confidence, nervousness about this, mm -hmm. I don't think they're capable of learning anything because their brain is in a whole so like another gear. Nightmare to it's a fight or flight, right? It's, it's a just... whole another gear. You yeah. cannot teach a dog that is not comfortable and confident in where they are and what they're right. doing. So the more we expose these pups to when they're young, the bigger the scope of that comfort zone is. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes time for the big ones, introduction to birds, introduction to the gun, those pups are, yeah, okay, yeah, this is from well, this. I've, is I've discovered a whole lot of new things in my life. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's sure. another, this is just another day, right? It'd be like if we went to New York City or a big city for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh gosh, I, I want to go home. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know this. Like, and then it's like trying to try to teach me something while I'm like freaked out from all the noises, yeah, right? Overwhelmed. You're so overwhelmed with newness, a lack right. of people thinking they're socializing, but they're not really doing a complete job. Not a complete job. Not That's a complete right. Job. And um, so it takes an effort on the owner's part. This is not a, you know, the socialization doesn't go on forever, but it's that first window where I feel like it's really critical. Mm -hmm. um, this is one I see a lot of, and even veteran people at Raising Dogs often are guilty of this. Rough house play with a puppy. They get them all hyped up, get home from work, get them all fired up, that dog's bouncing all around, coming out of his skin. I always know when a dog has been raised like that because now he's sent to Justin's school here and he's six, seven months old. And as soon as my hand goes to pet him, he's just coming out of his skin. We've created that sort of relationship with the dog. We have no attentiveness. Everything is nice. like that. Yes. Yeah. These sporting dog puppies have enough oomph in them as is we don't need to dump gas on that fire we don't <laughs> we don't need to act in a way to hype them up all the time yeah, yeah. okay they're gonna love us either way but i think some people kind of look how much my yeah. dog loves me yeah. yeah look how happy my puppy is to see me they're happy to see you if you don't do that too yeah right and i try and preach to people when you touch your dog remember the two s's your hands should always be soft and slow you want to try and develop a calming effect when you touch right. your dog, a settling yeah. effect. If, if that's what you want to do when you see your dog, that would be a good thing. Sure. Stroke in the back, stroke in the tail, feeling, you know. You're sacking, sacking them out a horse term, right? So it's exactly what you're doing. You want to explain thing. that a little bit? Yeah. Sacking out a dog? Sure. So uh, that's a term I call it a calming touch. Sacking out is a horse term that a lot of dog guys adopted. 
So you're conditioning the dog that when you put your hands on it to stand, relax, and give mm -hmm. itself to you. And remember down the road, not only do we not want to fight that overexcitability, we don't want to put that there first, but a lot of this training requires us handling a dog right. up close with hands on. And anytime we touch a dog, we want him to be relaxed and calm and accept our touch right. and allow us to do things with him. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so not only the training benefits of that, but I'm shocked by how many people it's a wrestling match to put eye drops or ear drops in or look in their mouth or check their feet. But they did it themselves by always. They, they put that there and then they didn't do the other <laughs> stuff yeah, too. It's yeah. only, again, it's a right. double whammy. Yeah. Um, so I tried, your dog loves you without that rough house play. Right. You're putting a little bit of a hurdle in there for the future that doesn't need to be there. Yeah. Um, retrieving is a huge deal to bird hunt. It is a huge deal to bird hunters. I see a lot of people do way too much puppy puppy retrieving at a very, very young age in an uncontrolled fashion, okay? So they'll take the puppy out in the backyard and they'll just start whipping stuff as far as they can <laughs> and the dog goes. Yeah. Test the waters when they're young. Every now and then you latch on to a puppy that wants nothing more than to bring that to you. Mm -hmm. If that's the puppy you got, great, you're lucky. Yeah. Um, small doses, but you should nurture that if you grab one of those. That's about two out of 10. The other eight are going to take off into the woods with it and lay down and chew on it. Right. Or run around circles and play keep away. That's yeah. all very predictable little puppy behavior yeah. Yeah. with thrown objects. Right. If that's what you have, do not keep doing it. Continuing to throw those things over and over and over is not going to miraculously go, oh, wow, he's bringing it right back to me right. with my hand. My dog's a solid retriever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so how does that like manifest later on? Like, what do you see when you see dogs that they've had that? That becomes the habit is if the dog doesn't naturally return to you with an object as a puppy, we cannot make them do that as a puppy. Okay. Just like pointing, retrieving is a genetic inherited instinct to one degree or another. It is in that dog. The moment we tap that instinct, we begin to influence it for better or worse. Yeah. And so if it isn't going right, don't continue to tap into that instinct and make a bad, what is something you don't want as a finished product, make that be what they do in that scenario. Yeah. You're better off to wait. If it is indeed there genetically, there's no expiration date on your dog's genetics. Okay, that instinct is still going to be there. Let's wait until he's a little older. We have some other things in place. And now we are in a position to influence it. Yeah. So unless you luck into that puppy that wants nothing yeah. more than to bring you something, don't keep throwing stuff and throwing stuff and throwing stuff. You can save that for later. Right? Gotcha. Yeah. And then like with a puppy like that, are you doing any like whether whether it's down a hallway or on a check cord? Both. Okay. Yep, both. And again, if they're not into it, I am totally fine waiting with it because I have 10 other productive things I can be doing with yeah. that puppy. There's a lot better things window. you could do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you don't yeah. want to, you don't need to do it all at once anyway. Yeah. So if it isn't going your way, sometimes you don't know what not to do. And it's okay to leave it alone for now. Yeah. right just to go back to it. yeah you, just because your pup doesn't do it at four months old doesn't mean he's not yeah. yeah yeah so don't a lot of people are freaking out i'm sure you get it a lot like, phone rings like crazy yeah my my dog's not pointing my dog's not retrieving Whoa, did i get it done <laughs> the universal first question i ask is how old is your dog yeah and they're usually quite young, young. yeah <laughs> quite yeah mm -hmm. um this one is, I think it starts as puppies. It, it has a little bit of a tie to socialization, but also some early command training. Um, I don't like to layer multiple new things at the same time on a puppy. Okay. So in terms of the socialization thing, I kind of like one new environmental factor at a time. And once I see the dog repeatedly is good, with like that, some taller yeah. grass or a little woodlot. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Then when you see that demeanor you're looking for, confidence. Don't go there to the pet smart the same day and try to do yeah three, three and new things in a day. Another example, and we're we're beyond four months now, probably right. yeah. with this example. Okay. Right. Um, 
introduction to the gun for puppies. An old standby method is chasing birds. Lots of guys go to that. It's an effective way to do it done properly. Um, but a lot of people who don't have resources at hand, they'll take the dog. He's old enough. I want to introduce him to birds. Okay. He get by some birds. Mm -hmm. Takes him to a place the dog's never been. Puts the birds mm -hmm. out. He's never seen any birds. And he's going to shoot a gun. And maybe he's got his friend with him. There's four brand new things to that dog. Just stacked four. You bags. just tilted the odds of something potentially not right. going well. The dog's in a place he's never been. He's never seen a live bird before. He's never heard a gunshot of any kind. He may not know the other dog in the field. Or person, yeah. They or got person. everybody with you or whatever, a stranger. Right. Now, there is a sliver of dogs there that they'll roll with that. Nothing phases <laughs> them, right? They're yeah. just that kind of dog that's made of that kind of genetic material. Don't bank on that being your dog. Yeah. Because yeah. if you're wrong, you could have a big rep. That, that kind of hope is not a strategy. No, that's right. Yeah. No. And yeah. so always err on the side of caution. So um, I use that because that's an example that I have firsthand seen somebody. And I go, it's pretty predictable, that dog. There's probably a lot of things he didn't like about that. And then right. you threw a gunshot in there on top of it. Yeah. But the premise is one thing at a time. Don't, not a bunch of multiple new things on a puppy. Yeah, so like with that example, so for example, you would, you go out to that field that you were going to work birds in. This is the this is spot you can do it. Social, you have access to it. Socialize, yep. the, let, let the dog just, okay, I know this area. 10, 12 fun runs, no birds. Yep. Different routes through the place. Right. So he's been there before. Yep, so when you pull in there, the dog, I know where I am, and this place is cool. Yeah. I like coming here. And then, you know, whether you do your foundation, Intro to birds, mm -hmm. get the dog all jazzed up on birds. So, yep, no shooting. Yep. Right. So, okay, we've added now second new thing. Yep. Okay. Wow. Birds are cool. This place is twice as good. Even yeah. better, I right? love it. It's I twice love as good as it was last time I was here. And you build in that if you're going to use the bird chase method, he's tearing off, firing off, chasing those birds around, having just a big old time. Yeah. And you do that not once, not twice. You do it multiple times just err on the side of caution right. before you bring in another new thing into that which would be the gunfire which would be the gun yeah. yeah right right and of yeah. course and and i don't want people to just go out there and start blasting 12 gauges you know right. there's a process and a method to doing this yeah gradually distance there's a lot of information available out that right and and we were talking a little bit yesterday when we were at your kennel and this is one thing I took home with, with the point we're talking about now is this doesn't stop when it's a puppy like this. This is important for the whole rest of the training process. You yeah. have to not stack so many things on top of each other. Sure. Right. Teaching them almost anything. It's a fundamental way that dogs learn. Now, because a percentage of people come to me and it is their very first dog, not just the first bird dog, their first dog. And they're trying to understand how to teach this animal. Yeah, I'm not a human. Um, so I try and grasp the ways to explain things that register with people that have no dog experience. So when you teach a kid to read a word, you don't put words in front of them. And then when they butcher the pronunciation, smack them on the back of the head. Okay. <laughs> You didn't go to Catholic school, no. did you? Well, <laughs> I'm sure you're Catholic. so no. Okay, so to read this word, what do you need to know? The you need alphabet. to you yeah. need to learn the letters of the alphabet first, mm -hmm. boom, 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 to be able to recognize them and know what know them by name. Now, what do you need to learn next? What sounds do those all make? Mm -hmm. Okay, gotta learn that. And then when we put these two together, it makes this sound. When we put these two together, it makes this sound. Yeah. Okay. Now we can take those that we've linked together, taught individually, put them together to make short, simple, basic words that, oh, well, yeah. he understands how to read that now. But if you try and teach a kid to read that word without that before, it's exactly what I see people trying to do with their dogs. Yeah. They're trying to teach something, but they have not dissected it into its smallest individual components first and then link those skills right. together. A dog needs to be able to do what we're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. And if they don't understand that, that's usually our fault. Yeah. So we gotta go, we always have to go backwards 
which is why that initial puppy work is so important. Yeah. yeah. And everything builds on something yeah, else. It can always, it's it's no skin off your back to take one step back. And if, you know, if the dog's not comprehending, okay, I'll take a step back. Yeah. And take, then move forward. And you need to be able to pinpoint why. Where is the glitch here? Right. And it, I don't care if it takes you one night to sleep on it and think about it or 10 days to think about it. What's important is you figure it out. Yeah. This isn't a race. Yeah. And I always preach. I have a three-year goal. That's what you should have. You should know what you want to have in a dog at three. And when they achieve any benchmarks, that's really irrelevant to me anyways. Yeah. Uh, you don't get bonus points. You're just building for three years. You're just building to, towards a, a great finished product. That's right. our goal. Right. Um, and, you know, on that note about teaching dogs command words, mm -hmm. okay, young dogs. So we're starting to dive into foundation right. commands. And might be a good place to also point out that, you know, this whole bird dog thing is commands, but also developing instinct, right? Mm -hmm. What these dogs do is not all mechanics and directed by us. We need to build and develop their hunting skills, the use of their nose, their bird sense, their mind. They need to become little predators, right? Yeah. But then we need the control commands to mold and shape that work to be beneficial to us yeah. and to be an enjoyable hunting companion. Um, so you're always doing both and then down the road they come together. But when you're teaching a command, I hear so many dogs mislabeled stubborn. And I always tell people, give me an example. Mm -hmm. And they'll give me an example. That's not stubborn, that's just partially trained. That's very <laughs> predictable. Partially trained. Yes. Yeah. So like, what's an, an example like? Well, okay. My dog knows here. When I call him, he knows to come to me yeah. because he will come to his owner around the house. He will come to his owner in the yard when there's nothing going on. Yeah. Okay. And then they're in a little more of a real world situation where there is away from home, different <laughs> sight pictures, yeah. distraction. a distraction or something that is tempting and just, you know, simply more attractive to the dog than turn around and coming to you. Right, yeah. Okay. Well, that dog is not stubborn. That's very, pre I could have told you he wasn't going to listen to you. And I don't even know your dog. <laughs> okay. But, but that's because a person didn't understand that you're, you're not done when your dog shows that first comprehension of what that word means. So I try and explain it as this is a three part process. You teach it and then you train it and then you have to prove it. And you're not done until you complete all three of those steps. That's a good way to view any and all command response and it training. Would, it would start right in their backyard. It would look like that sure. in their backyard, but then they have to prove it by going other places and doing it under different circumstances. And yeah, these dogs do not come to this world with a you know uh, handbook of definition of terms. Okay, so <laughs> the step one is to teach them what these words mean. Mm -hmm. Step one. Step two, when you train that command, is where through consistent reinforcement, putting yourself in a position to follow through every time they hear that word, that's when we communicate to the dog, and this is the training, that this is not optional. This is something you need to do every time you hear this word. Right. And that's through control in that environment, hands-on checkboard work. Um, and then once we see that that dog is doing it, he's doing it, he's doing it, now we need to intentionally seek out things that are going to cause the dog. That's the to, proofing it. Right. Part of it. So you think about what are the situations that the dog is likely to blow this command off. Identify those. Anytime you can identify why a dog blew you off. Okay. Now I know I need to train for that. Yeah. And you begin to purposely seek that out. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do a lot of evaluations for people with dogs. And I love it. You know, most of them haven't seen many birds yet in their life. And they get, they get into a bird, point, move, whatever. Dog's tearing after the bird, and the guy goes, like, You want me to call him back? I go, Give your box of shells if you can. Yeah. And, but, they, but they just don't know. They, right. They just oh, don't yeah. know. Yeah. What you don't do, well, I'm just going to keep calling. I'm going to stand here and keep so you calling. Just named. Keep calling, right? Yeah. He is hearing you and he is learning. And what he's learning, this is optional. The optional. This is optional. Yeah. So you need to develop that awareness 
in the, I call it protecting your training. I think we talked about yep. this a little bit yesterday. When you're in the process of training dogs, you always need to protect your training. And that means knowing when this is a losing battle, he is not going to listen to me. Yep. Either don't give it at all. If you're tempted to try it at once and you see absolutely nothing, this is not the place and the time to, to throw the respect you have earned right out the window. Right. And you had, you brought up a good point yesterday too, is just because you raise your voice. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Yes. Yeah. People will repeat the command and gradually increasing right. increments of volume as though on time 27, when right. I really am screaming, right. the dog's going to, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, don't wash out your training with that kind of handling. Right. It just go, okay, I can't enforce it right now, so I'm not going to give go it. Back to get a Close the situation. distance to the dog, do whatever you got to do to diffuse the situation, and now we know we're not there. Yeah. And then and to that point, you know, if a dog is running off, chasing a bird, and, you know, I'm sure in front of you, they're probably a little frustrated. They're like, oh, dang, my dog's not doing well. And then they get mad, right? It could be a little bit of nervousness yeah. on their part. Or it's like, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. I can't call them back. Like, the last thing you want to do is show emotion there, get mad. Yeah. Like, it's just like, would that dog come back? Okay, yeah. good, good dog. Well, usually evaluations are pretty young dogs. Yeah. And I don't expect to really see evidence of any training. I'm looking for potential and anything that could be problematic. I, I would worry if the dog was tearing off after the bird come. Well, okay. I want those dogs should want those birds, right? right. right? Mm -hmm. They should when they're pups. So that's totally normal stuff. It's not mm -hmm. a stubborn dog. Um, so the next thing on the list um, is when we are doing that work with the foundation command train, and you're putting your time in, you're doing the repetitions, and your time is being applied effectively. You know, a lot of people say, I don't have the time. It doesn't take much if you're doing it right for these mm -hmm. dogs to learn things. And uh, when you see concrete proof, you see this tangible results of this work you've been doing, it almost always spurs people to go too fast. You get excited. Yeah. This is working. He's got it. Okay. Well, he has it right now. Okay, let's do it again Thursday. Right. And then let same thing. And then let's do yeah. the same. Yeah. Let it be good. Repeat good. That repetitions are what make things permanent. Yeah. And anytime somebody says to me, he learned this in a week and I got him doing this. You know what yeah. I think? It'll go away just as fast. <laughs> there you go. Anything achieved quickly by a dog by nature is highly erodible. It's the long haul, consistent yeah. handling, consistent reinforcement. Practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan didn't quit practicing free throws after he made three of them in a row. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you yeah. need you need to continue. It's repetition over the long haul that really trains dogs. Yeah. Um, and this is a great tip for everyone who's trying to make that progression forward as these dogs are growing up. Anytime you're moving forward in a dog's training always carry something with you that's familiar to the dog from its previous training. Find a way to include something that registers with the <laughs> dog. These are all that you've got new, you're going into new territory, yeah. but you got to bring something they know with you into that new ter territory for them to latch on to and go, this is new, this is new, I know that. And then, okay, we've made a step forward. Yeah, so like, what would be an example you know, in a, in a situation, someone's training, what, what would that look like? I think uh, here's a common one for pointing dogs. Uh, steadiness is huge for pointing dogs. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay. The very foundation of reliably steady dogs is rock solid woe training. Okay. Well, a lot of people do a pretty good job of teaching woe in a very controlled environment. And I'm a big fan. I got some little early puppy hands-on woe stuff I do, but then a woe post used properly really is a lot of the meat of it. And dog trainers forever have called this type of dog training yard work, right? Yeah. Yard work obedience. Yep. You're not in a hunting environment. When you make that transition, the dog can only get so far in the yard. At some point, we need to be able to use this where we hunt. Okay. 
So when you're making that transition from yard work woe to in the field, I, it, yeah. I carry with me the distance that I'm giving that command in the field. He's still dragging a check cord. So when they're coming by me, whenever I get a chance, I'm not going to try and give a woe command when the dog's at a full run at 80 yards. That's too big a step. Right. But I've done hundreds of repetitions of woe in this dog's life in a circle at 15 yard. yards. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to build on that. So that's what you're saying. That's what you're bringing. That's what familiar I'm familiar to the dog. Correct. He's used to stopping at 15 yards and, hear and seeing you. So the first time you go to the field, that's the only time he's going to hear simulate it. what you did in the yard. He knows. And that. then you slowly. Yes. Can he's expect slowly more. Slowly stretch it out. Right. Slowly stretch yeah, it out. That makes sense. He's still dragging that. I think cord. Ben and I were both thinking a handkerchief and a <laughs> what, what did you What did you bring with him? No. But I even saw you do this when we made the Upland Institute. You would bring the tie out stake and the cable and move that out to. I move them all over the place. Right. But I mean, yeah. it was always kind of sterile in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then it was actually in a field that they had been in birds before, but there was no birds. Yeah. But it was in the bird field. And that's just a fun sight picture uh, more than. No, or, no, simply just because that's home training grounds and everything. It's a new location. Okay. You know, so the application for the average guy in a neighborhood is borrow your neighbor's yard for a yeah. couple nights a week. Right. If you got a buddy in the neighborhood or go to a friend's house or go to the nearest playground or park or something. Yeah. Right. Dogs are situation and location thinkers and learners. Mm -hmm. And if you only work in one spot, that's they can they only know it there only perform right. in yeah. one spot exactly they leave that place and initially they don't think well, we don't do that there <laughs> we've never done that <laughs> there right. you can't <laughs> possibly <laughs> think right but yeah. you got that's a good place to start right right but then you got to build on that and eventually we need a pointing dog to anywhere and everywhere we go whoa means hit the brakes right now and right. don't move until i kick you loose yeah right. yeah yeah and, and ron you were talking about uh, we've got a few questions about a, a tile tile stake yeah yes. yeah uh, and this is something that we talked about yesterday yeah, yeah. very passionate about yeah and and something that uh is kind of getting lost a little bit i believe it is it so so what like let's just start at square one what is a lot of people don't know what a, a tile stake is sure good sturdy stake in the ground short length of chain or heavy duty coated cable or something you know, 24 to 36 inches, um, good brass snaps with swivels on both ends, and you will clip your dog up to that. It's meant to restrain your dog. He can't go anywhere other than, and the stake swivels on the top, so he can go around and around right. like that. Um, and then uh, trainers, owners of multiple dogs, field trialers, people that have dogs in numbers will use multiple dog variations of that. I'm calling it a chain gang is the old yeah. term for that. Right. And they make them in three, four, five, six, however many you want. So does the same thing. Um, but if you just have one dog, just get a good sturdy single right. stake out. Mm -hmm. You're right, it is getting lost. Um, it used to be 100% standard issue. Every single bird dog trained when they were my, starting to- My first two months. dogs, I did that. And yeah. I didn't get it from you or Jim, I just, Read it in a book. It was common in all the old dog books. They tell you to do that. Right. Yeah. Well, it's it has even poured a piece of concrete, put an eye bolt in there. So the next dog that came, I had this spot to do it in the shade. Yeah. That was where his first tie out was going to be. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, there was about a decade there. I was like, eh. But yeah. how much those dogs were so much easier to just put the leash on, yeah. put the check cord on. Yeah. So many things actually build off what goes on there. So here's what's going on there. The first time you do that with your dog, and I like them at least four months old, and they've been run a bunch, they're confident. If you have a shy, spooky dog to begin with, okay, just wait on this. Mm -hmm. um, when that puppy feels that he's restrained, he's never really been restrained like that in his life. He's stuck. He, he absolutely is going to protest that and fight it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And They'll bite at that. They'll bark. They'll throw, a little fit. Fit. throw just a little, yeah, a little fit, a little protest. I'm stuck and I want off here. Your job is just to walk away and get out of there. Right. And that's between him and the stick. Yeah. And in a matter of minutes, they are, you know, 
it could be five, it could be 10, it could be 15. They're gonna relax and they're gonna accept that restraint. Okay. Yep, and, and like you said, the biggest thing is that's not, a, a big thing is that's not associated with you. No. The, the negative, well, it is a little, it gets probably a little bit stressful for them. It, it's for, a little, but, but for a short amount of time. A very short, a very brief window. And um, what is occurring there in your dog that affects his whole future training is he is accepting his ID, flat ID collar as a point of contact mm -hmm. that he has to give to. So time on a stakeout produces a dog and there's a few other benefits, but when we go to do check cord and leash training and handling our dog with leads and cords, a little tug on that and he doesn't fight that. You see a lot of these dogs, when they feel tension on that lead, they, they go bite it, right? Yeah. Give them a little tug. If he's been acclimated to a stake, up. Huh? okay. I, I know I, I can't got, win this I game. Yeah, I yep. come along. Right. It's a right. point of contact thing. Mm -hmm. And you've preconditioned that dog to give himself to a little light pressure tug on that point of contact that we established there. The other thing it does for dogs is it's a little bit of patience training. This world it's is not all about me. Not all about me. Every waking right. moment of the day, there's times, and crate training very much parallels that. Sure. Um, you can, we all love our dogs, but you can overdote on them to where you actually create dogs with separation anxiety. That crate, good crate training prevents that. Mm -hmm. um, dogs need to become comfortable in their own space and yeah. their own time, as well as the time that they're interacting mm -hmm. with us, you know? Yeah. Um, so I would really encourage people. I, I think we talked and I think we selected the stakeout segment from our series for yep. your, for your people to yes. put their eyes on. And what that is, is a <coughs> two, two about four month old Brittany puppy litter mates. And that was a true first time on a stakeout. I let that camera roll over 20 minutes. Yeah. And then it was at a time lapse edited. So you could see the progression right. there. And, um, and this is not a one-time event. This is something that you should do semi-regularly with their dogs. My dogs, I do it their whole life. Daily and for their yeah. whole life, because not only is it teaching that point of contact, it's also, I use it as, okay, I get done training, I put them on the stake out. Mm -hmm. Whether it's for 30 seconds, a minute, five minutes, an hour. Mm -hmm. Cause what it does is after they're done running, they've learned some, say you're working on steadiness. Um, you know, bird goes out, dog stops, good, okay. I go back to the chain gang or the stakeout, hook the dog up, and the dog can sit there and process, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you go right back into it, like that dog's head's just spinning, right? Like I have just forgot about this, now we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. So you put them on there, let them process a little bit, take them off, mm -hmm. go back in. So it's a good opportunity for them to just soak in what you've taught them. For sure. And that reminded me of something um, that I think is very important. A lot of people would fall into a category of a mistake. When you're training and a dog does something really right, right? I mean, okay, he does good. Okay, let him do a little something else and hang it up. There's nowhere to go in that session from there, but down. But a lot of people, they want to see that again. Right. And they yeah. want to see that again. It's no. fun. We like it. Right. right. It's right. Like my guy's doing great. Yep. Let it be good. Yeah. That, let, it, that, let it settle. Let it, let's put that check mark in the thumbs up training session column or call it a day. Right. Right. Yeah. And we'll do it again another let day. That really right. permeate, let that really permeate. Let it soak in. And then think, I mean, that's what they're thinking about probably for a dang long time as they go back into the box, they're thinking, oh man, I did good. That was great versus ending on a bad note where it's like, yeah. oh, like he, I can tell he wasn't happy because you know those dogs can pick up on. Yeah, that's something some really accomplished dog trainers I've had the good fortune to share their company in the field with. They've all got that sense of when to call it a workout, right? And I think a lot of novice people, they don't, they don't, because that's a hard one to develop, yeah. you know, and I think human nature, the excitement of something good yeah. going on, you know, I've watched guys put the rope on a dog when he's not even tired yet, or he's not even breathing hard yet. 
There's nowhere to go from where we are right now, but downhill. Right. Let, let it be him. good and let him put him up and let him think about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, just want to let you guys know again that we have got a, a giveaway going on. We'll post the link here in the chat, but it is a, uh, you know, a, a, a membership to the uh, Upland Institute complete series, mm -hmm. which goes over a lot of this. We're talking about all well, most of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And into, I mean, really everything from the puppy work all the way to train retrieve stuff and mm -hmm. finishing dogs yeah. completely steady on wild birds Yeah, and everywhere in between. So we tried to not leave anything out. Yeah. So click on that, that link that we posted and you have a you know chance to win as well as we're giving away some Onyx shirts and hats. And um, again, you can, uh, you can also go to Upland Institute and there's elite member get 15% uh, off the complete series as well as watch. Um, for example, that tile video is on there. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so more again, if you just joined us halfway through, we're talking about common dog training mistakes people make. So what do we got? Uh, what do we have next on the docket here, Justin? You know, we kind of bled into it a little bit. I think we used it as an example how, how you know, critical low training is to achieve reliable steadiness in pointing dogs and when we did a little quick scroll through some of the people that signed on for tonight boy it was there was a lot of steadiness and there was a, a lot of steadiness there. right and that's to be expected um just to cover our bases with first time pointing dog owners who don't have friends family hunt right. buddies and they're there out there oh for sure yeah. okay and I, I see them. People right. coming to me with their first Which dog. Which is fantastic. Oh, yeah. And it absolutely it is. Um, it needs to be understood from the very beginning that the act of a bird dog pointing a bird is not taught. That's inherited from their ancestors. That's an instinct, okay? Many people seem to be under the impression this is something we need to train our dogs to do. Right. Bring them into a bird. Stop. Is it oh. too early to teach my dog to point? All the time. I hear right. you. You don't teach a dog to point, you teach them to hold point. Right. But you can't teach a dog to hold point until they're pointing. Right. Okay. <laughs> so job number one is to wake up that instinct that is in your dog. If he mm -hmm. is from ancestors who pointed birds it's in there and it's very common for youngsters not to point initially that's okay i expect it that's not a mistake that i try and prevent especially you know through the foundation you get them hyped up yeah we right? want them to be excited birds. yeah let's get excited you bet you can't do anything wrong mm -hmm. this is what we're here for right okay yeah. um so whoa is an obedience command that we teach the act of pointing is an instinct that we nurture and develop. Step one, get them point birds. Right. That introduction, good introduction to birds. So we, we've seen a lot of questions that, you know, my dog doesn't point, it just wants to chase birds. How, like, if you're in that situation, what do you do? Yeah, the first course of action, and even dogs that point very briefly and then want to go in, which is very common, we need to shield our dog from that being successful. So we do not want to put that puppy in a situation where they're going to have success catching a bird pre-flight. A bird, you know, a lot of people yeah. in the off season or we're training with released pen raise game that mm -hmm. don't have a ton of survival instincts, right? Mm -hmm. Some are better than others. Try and get the best ones you can. Um, so you need to use those in a controlled fashion. If a dog that's not pointing, has success catching those birds or is successful post flush off a chase, there was something in it for him that worked. Mm -hmm. I want to make not pointing or pointing briefly and then flushing. Okay, I'm glad you love him and everything, but we it's imperative that he fails to get them. Yeah, catching a bird in that situation will only perpetuate it. You're taking sure. steps back. It, it works. Now, if you have a dog with strong pointing instincts and it happens once, it's never the end of the world. You do not want a steady diet of it, however. 
your dog would be better off. So that kind of warps the natural progression of a pointing dog because when they get into birds and they get in too close <clears> and up they go and oh, I chase them and they're gone. And we go over a while, here's another one, same thing. Next week, same thing. One of those days, you're gonna see that dog, instead of running there when he smells them, he's gonna slow down. And that's the first indicator that, okay, we're getting close to having a dog that points his birds. Okay. You know, I've got a little small collection of old dog training books that go back into the 30s and 40s and 50s. And there's no question these dogs we have now have more point, I think, than some of the old okay. ones because they talk about them flushing and chasing birds for yeah. a long time before they just, okay, they start yeah. to point them. But those guys were working on 100% wild birds pretty much. Some of those old times were using pigeons. But, yeah. Um, so you need to make sure that there's no success in that. And the woe is kept completely separate. And to influence a dog's pointing, which by my way of thinking should be post first season, I think trying to steady a puppy is often an exercise and frustration for uh, the Both owner the puppy and, and the, the puppy yeah. and the dog, and you're likely to do more damage than good. Um, hunting, you know. Go out once you got him introduced to the gun. He's establishing some set points. You'd be better off rather than putting him on more and more and more and more poor fly and pen birds yeah. to work on range and pattern. So we got a dog right. that goes with us in the field in the fall. Mm -hmm. Then go put a season on him, a hunting. Yes. And then come back around to your steadiness. All the while, we're building that obedience to woe to where it's stronger and stronger and stronger. And they're separate they're separate they're not pointing they're... pointing it i don't say a word to those dogs you know i had a young dog point a woodcock this spring in the woods training mm -hmm. and i'm coming around coming around and nothing lifts and i'm making the second pass in front of the dog i see that bird and it's about four feet in front of this dog and it was a big old head and she was spotted right to the ground now, i was 10 days in front of when our quiet season started but the way that bird was sitting there i thought oh man I wonder if she's on eggs, yeah. you know, shouldn't have been, but it could have was possible. Mm -hmm. Right. And my friend who was with me, he says, are you going to say, whoa? And I said, she knows whoa in the yard. She doesn't know whoa with a bird in her face. <laughs> right? yeah. So uh, no, I'm not going to say that because what's going to happen. And thankfully it was just a tight sitting bird. Yeah. Got, yeah. Up. It got yeah. out of there. So she knows, whoa, but not in that situation, not yeah. using it around birds. Right. Yeah. Not using not ready for that yet, and and it's something that you have to be very well. A lot of people have to be very conscientious of, especially you know if you've had dogs in the past, and a lot of people will walk up, you know, whether it's in hunting or in a field travel, walking up, and they almost don't know they're saying whoa, it's, right? It's just whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, and it's like, hey, <laughs> he's like, did I say whoa? I said, yeah, you said it about thirty times. Yeah, yeah, and it's. It's either someone, uh, a first timer emulating something they've seen mm -hmm. or often a nervous habit you know, that somebody has. But I, I see people, they're gonna engrave this on the urn that will hold my ashes someday. <laughs> I say it so much. Yeah. Saying woe when your puppy points does not teach it what woe means. I want people to always remember right. that. You're just talking while your dog is pointing. You might as well say apples. You could say anything, <laughs> yeah, right. okay? And then, so first season, developing point, shielding it from any bad birds, and then building a strong wall. And then after that first hunting season, that's when you fold those two together. Mm -hmm. Your dog will tell you when it's ready to be steady if you're watching and paying attention. You know, uh, it's been said a ton of ways by a ton of great trainers, but the gist of it is, you know, you're pretty wise to let a puppy be a puppy while he is a puppy, because otherwise they'll come undone on the back end. Of that. Okay. Yeah. There's a little bit of getting that out of their system. Yeah, I chased a bunch of birds and I broke a bunch of points and I busted a bunch I of I birds can't catch and it didn't work. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let them learn that. Is it what you want as a finished product? Of course not. But none of these dogs are perfect right yeah. out of the chute. Yeah, you don't take them out of the top, you don't take them out of the box and 
Try no. to, it's like a TV. You don't try to turn it on. It's like, oh, it works. No, it doesn't work like that. Let them learn some real world lessons. Mm -hmm. And is it going to cost you a little shooting? Yep. So what? It's an investment in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, the dogs I have seen steady pre-hunting experience and the dogs I've seen post, I think they turn out better. There's, there's first of all, way less risk of any negative side effects from right. steadiness training. Blinking, doing, things like, yeah. flagging on point, yeah. all kinds of stuff that could happen. Losing through. that intensity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Yeah. The only thing in this world is me and that bird. Yes. And let them come to that because that is really the highest level of impulse control we can ask of a pointing dog right. is to, no, don't move. Even though the ground is blowing up in front of you with wings and yeah. guns going yeah. off, right? That is not the domain of a seven month old dog <laughs> that is just learning to love this game, right. nor should it be. Yeah. And I have seen some people that were determined to grind that into them as puppies. And, you know, I watch that dog and I go, this dog's heart isn't in this anymore. You know what's going on between that dog's ears? How do I not get in trouble? Yeah. I don't ever want to see an uninspired dog in the field who's thinking, how do I not get in trouble? We want a dog thinking, where's the next bird? Yeah. And doing it with and for us, yeah. right? This is a relationship built over a couple of years, years, yeah, right? Because I'm sure you'd rather see, much, much rather see a dog come to you that mm -hmm. is wild chasing birds like that's his world versus a dog that's like, oh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, are you, you good with me doing this? I evaluated one two and a half weeks ago, smelled a bird, whole demeanor change, ring around the rosy a couple times and slinks out of there. And I, my heart just sank, yeah. you know. I looked at the guy, so that's not good. He goes, yeah, I go, yeah. He goes, how come he's not pointing? I says, I don't know. So he started talking. And I said to the guy, I said, I would have rather he ran in there with gusto and flushed that bird yeah. and chased. Well, I thought you wanted to point. I go, hey, at least if he ran in there and flushed it and chased it, I have hope. <laughs> then we're yeah. we're going to get him to yeah. point. What yeah. you have is damaged goods. <clears throat> that yeah. Dog, yeah. And then, then you have to back to your building box and you have to go back, right? Yeah. Uh, quite a bit. And if the that dog had been mishandled around birds in an attempt at early steadiness. Right. That's exactly what happened. That dog had had a lot of pressure put on him before he had any much bird experience to be perfectly steady right out of the chute. Mm -hmm. And he learned, man, every time I smell one of these, something bad happens. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I see that a lot in the people in the hunt test world trying to go so fast. And you can see it sometimes just in the dogs retrieving. You can see it in like other things too. Might still hunt pretty good, but they've steadied up a dog. You're like, wow, by 15 months old, you know. But then there's always something in the course of the day that shows, I don't want to be here. So it always shows up somehow. I'm really glad you shared that because you need to always have your radar on for signs that a dog's feeling pressure mm -hmm. from your training. And when you see that, you need to see that when it's a little dent. Yeah. Not a hole so deep, you can't see the sky anymore. <laughs> this yeah. guy with this other dog, that <laughs> hole never should have got that deep. Right. Now he didn't do that to that. Dog, right. But his defense. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> so pressure. If somebody says that dog's had a lot of pressure put right. on it, there's all kinds of different ways a dog can feel pressure. A right. lot of people think that means some kind of heavy-handed correction. Yeah. No, it can be asking for more restraint and control and right. polish and Those adult level layers. Performance layers yeah. Yeah. layers then the dog is ready to right handle at that young yeah. of an age yeah right uh, you so know. you send them to school and tell them you're gonna take the bar exam on a weekend yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. too much it's just yeah. too much build them one block at a time yeah, yeah. um anything yeah. jumping out at yeah you? we've got a number of questions um here we can start answering again. If you've got questions, please put them in the, the chat. And if we don't get to them here, um, we'll follow up and make sure that your questions get answered. So uh, one question, and I know we, we talked about this before, but um, someone's saying, hey, 
I don't have access to birds. Yeah. What do I do? Mm -hmm. We did talk about this because this is what I feel is a mistake is using, I don't have fill in the blank. And so I'm, I'm not going to do anything. Right, right. Right. I can't do anything. Right. No, yes, you can. Okay. What do so you do? What do you do? Okay. He didn't provide any info on dog. Yeah, uh, really he doesn't. A, yeah. Nine month GSP. Okay. Um, he, he did say he's going to start trapping birds or trying to trap birds for training. Pidge, so he must be trying to trap yep. some pigeons yep, or something. Exactly. Sure. Okay. Um, so you think about all the other good things he can do that don't require a bird. Okay. Great training, introduction to the stakeout, tons of exploratory walks in the field and different types of cover and terrain. Start at that age, he could probably start some basic handling to turn when you ask him to turn, start working on check cording, check cording working on a forward pattern. He could start building in his recall. Mm -hmm. He could certainly begin his woe training. But again, we're not going to be applied to pointing at this point. Church and state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And here's what you want to think is when that dog shows me he's ready to be steadied, I need to be ready. And I got that woe training ready and waiting in my back pocket. Right. Right. It's there when he's ready. I'm ready when he's ready. And then you put them together. So again, because you're not teaching a dog woe well in front of a bird, it doesn't have anything to do with right. It's not exactly. training. But so just kind of going back to what you said, yeah, he doesn't, doesn't need a bird. bird. No, woe means stop and. I guarantee that dog really actually really likes birds. He he should. He should. He's a German well, short air right. pointer. Okay. Right. Right. Um, introduction to the gun. We reference the bird chase method. Okay, mm -hmm. that's only one way to do it. Okay. Why does the bird chase method work and work well? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, it gets us more distance between dog and gun. And two, it gets us a dog that's in a very positive, confident, excited yeah. frame of mind. We're making an association with something the dog loves. And the distance allows us to be gradual with the noise, right? Yeah. Uh, but that is far from the only way to do it. Anything you can pinpoint that gets you those two things, distance and excitement and positive frame of mind and confidence, that's a viable option. I've done it with a ton of dogs, believe it or not. Some dogs don't have a lot of chase in them mm -hmm. and are naturally really close working. Okay, I to get this done, right? So yeah. uh, retrieving, yep. dogs that are bonkers for retrieving dummies. And, and really when you're using that for the purposes of gun introduction, it isn't so much about the quality of the return. It's about, whoa, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, right? Right? There, it's like when I hear when I'm retrieving, I hear that cool. bang. Yeah. Like when I hear that bang, that's that's exciting. There's something yeah. good going on. Yeah. And then the other one that I actually probably employ as much or more than those other two put together is just background noise neutralization. Just desensitize them to it gradually during the course of all these field runs I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Very, very quiet blanks first. So they're running gradually louder, gradually louder. It's just another noise in their environment. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't require go. any birds. It doesn't it doesn't it. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and so he can do some gun introduction in a non-bird format. Um, one, one point about that, that I thought of when you were talking about that is, um, that I, I see a lot of people make is when, let's just say that situation, you, you fire a gun or a, a blind pistol or something, and that dog runs to you and is like, you know, maybe a little freaked out. Maybe you might've screwed up, shot a little too close. And then your instinct is like a child, right? To grab and say, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Like, don't worry about it. Nope. That's that's essentially sitting that behavior is like it's bad, like I'll comfort you. Yeah. So you just affirmed that little shred of him, like, was that okay? No, you don't speak a word of that time. You don't even break stride. You keep right like, on walking. If you push the window at any stage of the gun introduction and you get a reaction for the dog and he comes to you, <coughs> you didn't look at. It. You don't even speak yeah. to him. You don't even reach your hand out. You just keep right on walking. Oh, yeah. well, he's not bothered. Oh, you know, yeah. No more shooting. Right. You should loosen back up, reassess. Okay. New plan. 
I'm going to do that again. That's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. So assuming that he can accomplish his gun introduction, he's got a dog that's staying with him, going with him, whatever. Since he bought a bird dog, I assume he's going to hunt somewhere that has birds, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, start taking him there uh, three, four weeks before the season opens. And go look for, he didn't say where he lives, but, yeah. you know, wherever that is, whatever your hunting is going to be, check your laws on off hunting season yeah. training. But most states, you can go out with your dog minus gun. You usually still need to have a license to be legal. Mm -hmm. Check every state's different. Yeah. And go looking for birds. Yeah. With no yeah. gun. You okay. Get up to a month or more, right? Yeah, it depends on yeah, the state. But yeah, sure. Most yeah. states you can get out there, get out in the morning when it's cool, and there's your bird introduction. He's gonna find some sooner or later. Yeah, right. Yeah. You don't need to build a, a, a bird pen in your backyard, which your wife will probably thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. Yeah, right. Um so the upside is he may not have any poor training birds. And if he can yeah. find him some wild birds and End of July, August. Yeah, he's going to be better off. He, you know how Could be, right? You know how many times people will tell me they get a, a source of birds in the off season, and this is a puppy, right? Yeah. And about once a week, they're putting birds up. Putting that dog, you know. Okay. And after two months, I'm like Justin, that's when they're calling me. Boy, he's he's not pointing much. <laughs> I said, where is very best points some of the early ones sure yes why why is that i'll tell you why he's learning this thing ain't afraid of me yeah right and i can, I can get I, I can get away with all kinds yeah. of stuff on you would have been better off not to let him learn that right use them just enough to wake up those instincts right yeah, that's enough then. that's enough stop yeah. you gotta know when to stop yeah now fast forward another year and we have a dog with a season of hunting on him a dog that's woe broke. We do some formal structured steadiness and we achieve a dog that is controllable. He's holding his points more now. We're teaching mm -hmm. him to hold his points now. Mm -hmm. We now have a little more wiggle room in what we can use for a training bird, i.e., a pigeon or a chalk or, or, right. or something, right. because now we got a dog that we've done some steadiness right. with and everything. But when puppies, not if, but when they make a play for that bird, I need a bird to do what a bird needs to do. And that's get up and get off, fly out of his life. Yeah. That's what we need to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> so hey, there's so many great things that, that he can do um, without birds. Yeah, yeah. And then if you're looking for birds, you know, if you say, you got, I gotta have some birds. I live, you know, I mean, I lived in Mississippi. And there weren't much for wild bird John. You know, <laughs> walk along for a long time. Yeah. <coughs> Craigslist. Sure. Get pigeons off of Craigslist. Yeah. Try to avoid quail. Yeah. You know, you can read up on trapping pigeons, um, local clubs, whether you're, you know, the DDD, GNA, MAVGA, lots of clubs. Google it. Yeah. And most time people are super excited to help you. Um, you know, they, they love doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you don't have any source of birds, I mean, I assume he's gonna hunt, if it's not wild birds, yeah. he's gonna go to some hunt club or yeah. something yep. like that, right? Yeah. So maybe you can start to take them out there, uh, you know, early in the season and talk to the owner. You know, the thing in that is it costs the hunt club operator the same, whether you're killing them or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's, 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 look, yeah. you, you can't raise a bird dog without them. So yeah. that's just an investment in the future. You can't yeah. make a boat and not have a lake to put it in. Yeah. You, have a <laughs> you want a boat? You got to plan on taking a trailer. You might live on a lake if you're lucky. Yeah. But you got to figure out having a trailer and be the boat in the water. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, my husband and I are both planning to hunt with our Brittany, do we need to choose a main owner that she'll respond to? Or can we train her to listen and obey to both of us? This is a good question. I, I like this. Great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, this dog very much can be trained by both of you, <coughs> respond to both of you, provided that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. You guys are handling this dog in a similar fashion. You're training this dog in a similar fashion. Um, 
the dog, as long as both people are consistently teaching and enforcing commands, because I'll guarantee you the inflection and in his voice and hers are very different. And dogs are masters at picking and choosing who they do and don't listen to. Just like to. kids, right? right? It's like manipulation. But almost. it's all about who follows through, yep. right? And mm -hmm. so as long as each of them are enforcing commands once they're taught and handling the dog in a similar fashion, dogs can very much have multiple handlers. Um, the one thing I need to point out is before you turn that dog loose, you decide if you're together, only one of you is handling that dog at this time. Do not sense. switch back and forth during a set training session yeah. or a hunt. Yeah. Whoever's handling that dog when you leave the truck is the person that handles it for the duration of that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot of gross questions. Uh, <laughs> Good. That's yeah, right. yeah. 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 Gross hunters. Um, so one of this question here is my GSP. Likes to overrun girls, great on woodcocks. Any suggestions on helping him not overrun? Overrun. Birds? I'm guessing just maybe we were talking about this yesterday. I had a dog that put a lot of pressure on Sharpies because he was used to running on pheasants. And, you know, your answer was spot on to that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing a lot of people use similar terms to describe different things. So right. overrun to me my vision when somebody says that is you know he just his dog is running through the woods and all of a sudden he just hear it cross, you know and it happens again and then every now and then he's getting pointed out on woodcock. Woodcock. Yeah. woodcock are quite cooperative they yeah. are they're a twitchy woodcock but day yeah. in and day out uh, god made woodcock for pointing dogs i mean all <laughs> all pointing dogs right yeah. they're pretty cooperative um rough grouse are not going to tolerate that kind of encroachment by a dog. So if this is a uh, under three-year-old dog, okay, it may be a matter of more experience. Yep. Very well could be, especially if a season for him is not necessarily a lot of grouse contacts, depending right. on where he's hunting. Yeah. Right. If he's hunting in some area where there's not a lot of grouse density, he just hasn't racked up enough experience yet to figure him out and learn how to handle him. Um, if this dog is in his middle years and has been afforded a lot of grouse contact, it's very possible, if not likely, that there is a necessary skill set genetically that just is weak in the dog. Mm -hmm. And, and, not every dog born to this world is made of the right stuff to be a dog that can consistently go out and find and handle rough grouse. You know, they're a tough, <laughs> tough bird. For yeah, a dog yeah they are. Yeah, one of the toughest. And and, and so and don't feel bad. Of that don't. It doesn't mean you have less of a dog. It means you just didn't luck into that dog yeah. that had the right combination mm -hmm. of skills. Um, here is one thing I should point out, though. If that dog is smelling them from far enough away, and okay, not, and oh. he's kind of working into them, and they're flushing, right? Yeah. And, boom, and off he goes. Okay? Yeah, fun. <laughs> it can be. Yes. I have turned around a lot of dogs in my life, not just for this issue, but for a lot of other bird work related things. I would spend my entire off season with this dog, teaching him to stop the flush. Yeah. Okay. So that when he hits that bird scent and he goes in there, there goes that bird. Whoa, stop. Oh, nothing in it for him. Chasing yeah. birds is fun. You said it's the first yeah. thing you said. Okay. Yeah. Fun. Chasing birds is fun. Anyone ever told you, well, if you just don't shoot it, he'll quit. That was a question here. Don't buy it. Really? No. Okay, because chasing birds is fun. That premise hinges <clears throat> on accepting that the dog's reward is the retreat. Well, that's not always the case. For a lot of dogs, it is. For, for many dogs, it is. But that's expecting an awful lot of a thought process in a dog. You know, I flushed him and I chased him, but he didn't shoot him. 
if he would have shot him, that would have been more fun it for me. So the bit. next time I'm going to point and hold, that's a lot of layers. That's a, a lot. That's a stretch. It's another okay? whole strategy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I have found is taking away the fun of an uncontrolled detached chase and insisting on stopping to the flight of a bird. That will make a dog more cautious. And then when you do start to get some points from a distance, go in there and kill them, right? Mm -hmm. Aha, now, now it's a clearer connection, okay? But you can't reward the dog with dead birds. This guy can't shoot what he's flushing and chasing. Yeah. So he's got to get a little traction first on the pointing. Um, if the dog is running around and a lot of dogs, that this is the question, if you watch them, when they hit that light scent or a moving grouse, they go nose down. Nose goes down, the bird's coming up. Right. These dogs got to learn to keep that head up and sift those air currents. We can't mechanically teach a dog. To and that do goes that. like that some dogs genetic just aren't going to make a, a grouse dog. A great grouse dog. That's a fact. Yeah. We yeah. Need, you need to know it. But don't pull the plug on your dog because no. he's not a great grouse dog when he's young. Keep putting him right. in the grouse. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's amazing how if you can show them enough birds, a lot of things just work themselves out yeah. in time. Yeah. 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 So we have we have uh, 15 minutes or so okay. here. We are getting a ton of questions on the train retreat. Yeah, of course. Tons, uh, lots of questions. Um, let's just find here one find one here. Um uh, one, you know, a lot of questions about my dog. Either it'll get the bird and not come back to me, it'll circle around, stop out there, maybe not eat the bird. Not hard mouth it, but it's just hanging out. Won't bring it all the way to you. Mm -hmm. Any dog that has had a good amount of birds killed for it. Okay. Again, we touched on it earlier. This is a genetic instinct. Okay. Mm -hmm. That we've tried to nurture through some natural retrieving development. And we've seen what they do while we hunt with their down birds. Okay, the first handful of birds killed over a dog is not what we have for life. Give him time, keep hunting him, see what he does. If we have a second year dog and, okay, this dog has had 50, 60 birds shot over. I'm just grabbing a number, but mm -hmm. we're now crowding between two and three years old. And we still have these consistent same things in the retrieve. It's going to need our help to one degree or another. Yeah. Okay. Now, the beginning to end process is far beyond the scope of a discussion to accurately tell someone this is how you fix this. Yeah. Okay. You could sit here for hours, and, days. And you also need uh, some we, illustrations. Some yeah. illustrations. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. demonstrations. Yeah. Okay. But I will reference what we talked about early on about you got to learn the alphabet before you can learn to read okay yeah. so for a dog that stops and drops part way back in any kind of mouth manners anything that is an incomplete retrieve you got to go all the way back to the beginning and you got to start with basic hold of non-bird objects in a yeah. controlled situation progressing through hold and carry Different objects moving into the field, still not shooting birds, right? You don't, don't everybody wants yeah, to go right to that. Um, and then we need so teach hold and carry as a command first, teach it thoroughly, proof it as well as we can before we move into phase two, two distinct phases, which is the fetch portion, which is we are going to make fetch a trained command yep. versus a request this isn't fun anymore anyway. it's not all fun and games or roll the dice i'm well, doing it because you're doing it because i'm telling you yes you to do it. much the same as you need to heal because i'm, I'm going to teach you what heal means it's mm -hmm. just like any other command only it's a little bit more involved than some of those but we're teaching the dog to grab an object on command mm -hmm. and then initially first presented right in front of him and then a little further and a little further and then down on the ground. And it, yep. it is all tiny little micro steps. If there's an area before you attempt this as a first timer, you want the most thorough education you can give yourself. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and I was going to tell everyone out there that this is a perfect 
scenario where you, you go on Upland Institute and watch that start to finish because it's so hard to grasp in bits and pieces. It's so nice to be able to see the dog go from step A all the way through Z. Yeah. And then with that, I, I mean, so many of these questions could be, you know, remedied with the trained retreat. Tree. Right. Do not do this before your dog goes hunting for a season. I, I think I think you're liable to do more harm than good with certain dogs and, and <clears throat> applied improperly. It's okay to let him have a season and see what he does with his birds. You know, you you don't need a perfect delivery to hand the dog's rookie puppy season to right. go out and have right. a good time. Let him have some fun. Let him learn. Get that baseline, just like we do that before teaching the advanced steadiness. Mm -hmm. We should give a young dog that prior to expecting a higher level of training in his recovery again. Yeah. Okay. Now he's mentally prepared to understand that and he understands the whole here. And, you know, yeah, our, our, our series is really good and thorough, but I would encourage people read a bunch of other stuff too, watch other stuff too, because the more information you gather, it's all tools in your kit. Yeah. Um, and it's also a thing, if you have a local pro who's good at that, I would like people to do this yourself because you're going to be a better dog trainer when you're done. And then you know, yeah, you, knowing how to like, reinforce it. That's the biggest thing. Cause then one. they get in the field and they do it. And then you're like, fetch, yeah. fetch. Yeah. When maybe that's not, not, not the right. Thing. But you don't yeah. know what you know. There they, know. Go, there they right. go naming it again right. when right. it's not yet yeah, done. Can, yeah. Right. yeah. And so, but when you hit little snags or something, you know, if you have trouble working through them, try and find a go-to person, an experienced dog yeah. person who's done it with a variety of dogs who can maybe take a peek and then watch you work your dog and see where the snag is and go, yeah, I've gotten dogs through that before. Here's what you need to do, yeah. right? Because yeah, yeah. there's all these little infinite variables right. that individual dogs will throw at somebody. But the main thing is if you begin it at the beginning, go all the way through to the end, cover your bases, don't skip around. Because if you start skipping steps to get to what's fun for you yeah, uh, or get directly to where your problem is, you're leaving a weak link in the chain. Mm -hmm. You said that a lot with the retreat retreat. People start seeing new objects, new objects. And they think they're ready. He's got it. I want to go shoot birds. It's ready. It's, it's ready. the last thing you do. I know. It's That's the last thing good. you do. And you can be 80% of the way through this and your dog is not an 80% better retriever. Not yet. This is an all or nothing program. Right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it takes you three months or a year to take a dog through. No, I think that really, you say the series, Justin, this is something you can come back to. All the time. Yeah. And, the, and you probably will have to. Yeah. Well, I mean, unless you have the time to go boom, 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 you, you're still going to have to maybe tweak it or if you see something sloppy figure out what you did wrong but you mentioned that you could start on it and if you had three weeks to start on it you could go do something else and you could come back to it it's not you could take two months off right and come back to it and that dog is exactly where you left him if it's at this point or this point or this point it'll be exactly where right you there. left him yep. the dog doesn't go backwards in that kind of training from no work they right. can only go backwards from bad work <laughs> there you go. In that though, would you start? Would you do a quick refresher? Sure. Or, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Quick refresher. Yeah. But, but I think most people would be shocked. Like, you you oh see enough to go. He's right where he was. Like you stopped yesterday. Right. Yeah. 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 Um. You, you know, you made a comment. There was a question about it as well. But you know, the first year as a puppy, mm -hmm. they they can do no wrong essentially. What about when it comes to eating birds? That's a tough one. And, and when I say they can kind of do no wrong, that's with like pointing and steadiness, <laughs> yeah, right? right? You know, we still want a dog to learn to handle and all these things. Eating birds is a tough one. It's not <laughs> one you see very often. Yeah. Here's been my experience with it. <clears throat> if you correct it, you're running the risk of the dog. <clears throat> it needs to be done with some care. Because you're running the risk of the dog, okay, a down bird is bad. If you go over the top with the correction, mm -hmm. you're definitely going to want some way, like dragging a light cord, try and do it. 
I've always called it puppy hard mouth. And I've seen some youngsters, the very first handful of birds you kill over them, they turn into a little coyote on you. Chomp, 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 chomp. Oh my gosh. gosh. It's, I, I got one of these, right? <laughs> it's this loop, fresh killed yeah. birds. Warm, nice. And, yeah. And you know, a lot of times the answer is just keep killing birds. Just keep killing birds. And then they start ratcheting down mentally a little bit because it's another dead bird. I had some of these last week and last month and the yeah. year before that. A lot of dogs will grow right out of that. Mm -hmm. I can sympathize with the guy who sent that in because if you've been hunting hard all day you know, and you finally yeah. just scratched out a big old rough grouse or something or the, oh. and your dog eats it, yeah, none of us are going to be a real happy camper with that, right? Yeah. But you got to be, you got to use some caution. <clears throat> if it persists, then the trained retrieve is really the only solution. Yeah. Um, it's really rare though, but it does happen. That is a true bad luck of the draw. Yeah. If it's in those genes and stays. Yeah. If it stays. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to, I'm going to tell you probably nine out of 10 of them quit. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you that dog's fairly young. Yeah. If he's two, I get on the train to retrieve pronto. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you know, another theme I'm starting to see in here is, um, you know, in terms of the search pattern and developing mm -hmm. that search pattern. For yeah. example, here, um, you know, she gets really excited. Well, that's maybe a little bit different. Um, she gets excited when there's birds in the field, quarters out a little bit too far. We've got another question here that is, you know, he is making hot laps or, running in straight lines yeah, yeah i'm a pattern nut i i don't like dogs hunting at all points of the compass and then coming back and finding it taking a flyer over here and doing that yeah so that actually begins on those puppy walks that's where you're putting your seed for patting up pups learn to go with you there if you walk them right nice steady walk making turns nah, nah, nah. our initial check cord work to teach a dog to turn okay that's going to be our tool to influence both the dog's range and pattern. We need to be able to turn them. A very common bad handling habit to try and influence a dog's range or pattern is to try and lean on your recall, okay? It's a natural response for a lot of people. The dog's too far away, come back to me. What does that create? Dogs go, yo-yo. I don't want that, mm -hmm. okay? I want recall to mean stop hunting and come all the way into me and park it until I kick you loose again. So to influence the dog's range of pattern, we need a turn signal so we can have a little steering wheel on it. And now those long straight line casts, we can turn them, okay? It's going this way, we can turn them. Somebody wants to try and keep a dog closer, you need to be able to break those long casts off. If we got the dog doing hot laps, you gotta be able to turn them reliably, right? Use your body language. I teach them to turn on one little two to the whistle. You can use a verbal call, whatever, but you need a cue to turn that dog. Yeah, and, and for people that don't know, explain like 30,000 foot view on what check cording is. Sure, um, 20, 25 foot, buy one that's made for dog training. It's got a good stiff core in it. Don't go to the most neighborhood hardware store. stores it's going to be far too limp right yeah. buy a good check cord all of the major dog supply companies carry them um it's a it's a long lead right and in the front end you're going to be hands-on working that dog teaching that turn signal yep so you're essentially wa wanting that dog to go make it s s pattern and you're you're doing that you're flipping the check cord over you are it. and and i'm less concerned at that front end stage on how the pattern looks i'm more concerned with his direction of travel is this way there's my cue boom i got a turn i'm not worried about this perfect pattern yeah. it's more imprinting in the dog that that's a cue i got to change my direction okay and then as the dog masters that okay that's where we're going to overlay the e-collar for some collar conditioning properly done i saw a bunch of collar questions in there no way we can address all those but in a nutshell collar conditioning is teaching a dog how to respond to a collar stimulus so for this case it's learned on check cord command has learned to turn once it's learned to learn well we're going to overlay low level stem on the collar on as soon as he turns off pressure on pressure off 
Again, just model enough that he can feel it. Uh, it was during filming, Ron was watching, I was collar conditioning some dogs. I don't even remember what for. And he goes, we're just teaching them a new language. Yeah, it's like, like three languages. And I go, that's yeah. exactly what it is. Please remember true collar conditioning, you're using the collar as a training tool. It's a stimulus. We condition, it's all real low level stuff, but a lot of people are hesitant to, for that step because they've seen collars misused in the field. Mm -hmm. it, is not, it is not a last resort correction tool, right? Yeah. And when you push that button, there's no like bolt of lightning or anything. I have very often with my customers, I said, look, I'll put it on my hand. I go, mm, right there. That's yeah. what I'm using my hand. Right. Yeah. Many times in the collar conditioning, and we had to include in our series a little light that showed when the collar was on and when it was off, because you're not going to see any big reaction from the dogs. Right. Just enough so they can feel it. Okay. <clears throat> collar condition that dog to bend them in that turn. Now I can pattern him. Yeah. Now I can pattern him. Right. When I can bend him. All right. And I tell people this is a moving invisible fence, mm -hmm. and I'm whole plate. First and third baselines are a little bit wider for a bird dog and <laughs> play ball. Now, let's play ball, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, we don't want to go a dog's entire life to go here, to go there. No, no, no. This is temporary. And when you teach that, consistently handle a dog in that fashion, you'll watch him. Boy, you're just getting ready to call on him to turn or use your whistle signal yeah. or whatever. Right. right, or I'll see that dog in open country coming across, flying, and I'll catch him throw his head like that. And he's looking for me. Yeah, if you're where you're facing, where you're yeah, huge, he's looking at me, he's reading my body language. I am building handler awareness. And to me, when you can stroll along and not say boo, and that dog just lays out there in front of you, going at it, trying with all right. his heart to find a bird, and you start turning, and he sees that, and he swings around in front of you. That's just beautiful, right? Yeah. But they're not all born patterned like that. No, we need yeah. to help them yeah. get there. So just through the turn signal, be able, the ability to turn your dog is your number one tool to influence range of pattern. Um, I'm just looking at all these questions, and, and so many of it go to one of the first points you brought up about breaking it down and just taking a step back, using it in building blocks. Yeah. So... You know, if you're if you've got a question, if you're training and maybe you don't have a resource, just stop, take a step back, think like, okay, what components go into this? Yes. And then take a couple steps back and start there. Yeah. That that I mean, all the, a lot of these questions can be broken down into that. And does that component itself sometimes? Okay, we break it into these two, and then this one gets broken into a, there's there's a couple yeah. components that go into that one. Just like what we were talking yeah. about with with hold, yeah, and you know failure to recall. Sure. Do you have two problems at like for a dog dropping the bird? Yep. Or molding it, and then the dog coming not to coming to you. Two right. separate things. Yep. So you gotta you gotta address both of them separately. Yep. And then link them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've uh, we've reached time here again. I, I appreciate both of you guys. Yeah, on. this was oh, I could fantastic. All night. I and, love talking dogs. Yeah, and we'll we'll have to do it again soon because so. yeah. this is something that we could sit and probably talk about for hours and hours. Yeah. Um, again, make sure you guys go and click on that link uh, to enter the giveaway for the complete series Upland Institute as well as some Onyx gear. Um, you know. I I can't I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys. I've learned a lot of stuff just sitting here tonight. So we hope you did too. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, uh, you guys are on Instagram. Uh, well, yeah. Well, 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 that's a loaded question. I think Ron's <laughs> daughter's on Instagram. Yeah. yeah, I have a network of help. But anyway, if you do have a question or you think you're ready for it, you have a question about it, we have a contact page on the Upland Institute. Yeah. And just tell me what your concern, your question is. Give us your numbers. We'll call you. We'll write you. If you think this is something that's right for you, we'll be glad to really get in a little depth with you, too. For and sure. Um, I would say the uh, you can't get that when you buy a book. You can't call the author. You can't always get Justin around the phone, <laughs> but you can reach us. Yeah, yeah for sure. I yeah. do my best. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Well, again, we appreciate it. And for all of you that sat and, uh, and listened and did some learning, uh, thank you as well and have a good evening. Night, y'all. <laughs>